Part of this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. This video was created with the help of AI. Video game AI. Because that's the subject of the video. Roll the intro. Artificial intelligence is becoming more and more a part of our daily lives. But in video games, AI has been used since the very beginning. Think of games like Space Invaders, Pong and Pac-Man. All of these use AI in some way or another, albeit a simple form of it. AI doesn't have to be complicated to be really good. One of the best examples of this is Pac-Man. In the original Pac-Man, the ghosts have an incredibly simple algorithm for their AI, with great results. The ghosts move in a straight line, until they encounter a junction. At that junction, the ghost will either choose the path closest to the player, or pick a random route. Which one they choose is different per ghost. Some will choose the path towards the player more often, while others have more random behavior. This bias is the only difference between the behaviors of the ghosts. And while it's incredibly simple, to this day the different ghosts in Pac-Man are believed to be working together, employing different tactics to surround the player, and planning ambushes. Players have even reported strategies among the ghosts, with Blinky leading the player into an ambush, where the other three lie in wait. Fucking Blinky. I knew he was up to no good. Since then, video game AI has drastically evolved, where you have challenging computer-controlled enemies to fight against in all sorts of games. Think of the enemy AI in first-person shooters such as Fear, or in strategy games like XCOM or StarCraft, but also in card games like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering. I could go on for a while, but the point is, there are many examples of widely different kinds of games which all use artificial intelligence. The question is, how do they work? Do they all use different systems, or is it possible to reuse the AI of one game and put it in another one? Well, let's dive in. Luckily for game developers, there are several algorithms to choose from for various different purposes, which they can tweak and modify to use in their games. The first of these algorithms is Minimax Trees. This is used for determining the best decision from a set of limited actions. Think of games like Tic-Tac-Toe or Chess. These games have a board with a limited set of moves the player can make. The trick is of course to make a move that is not only optimal for this turn, but also for future turns. When making a move, you also need to consider the moves your opponent could make as a reaction to it, and what you could do after that, and then what your opponent would do next, and so on and so on. As you can see, this problem gets very big very fast. Luckily, some clever engineers came up with an algorithm to explore all of these options and pick the best one. Minimax trees. Let's look at tic-tac-toe as a simple example of how this will work. Like many things in programming, Minimax is represented as a tree of nodes. Every node in this tree represents a choice you can make, resulting in a different state of the game. To keep it simple, let's start with just two possible choices. First, it's Red's turn. He can make two possible choices, resulting in two different game states. Then, it's Blue's turn, who again has two choices per game state. This continues until we either reach the maximum depth, or until the end of the game is reached. Next, we need to determine the score of these final nodes, or leaves. We determine the score by looking at the state of the game and giving it a score. The higher the score, the better. For tic-tac-toe, that will be plus one for a win, zero for a tie, and minus one for a loss. Then, from these leaves, we work backwards towards the starting node. We can see that going up, it was Blue's turn last. We assume that Blue chooses the option that is best for them. Because we play as red, the lowest score for us is the best score for them. So between scores of minus 1 and 0, blue will choose minus 1. Working our way up, we can see that it is now red's turn. Just like blue, red chooses the option best for them. Red will pick the maximum value out of all its choices. So in this case, that is 0. We use these steps to fill in the rest of the tree. Blue picks the minimum value, red picks the maximum value. Blue min, red max, min, max, min, max. Well, you get where the name Minimax tree comes from. Doing this, we can now see what choice we have to make. We can pick between one where we tie or one where we will win. So of course, we choose the option which gives us the maximum score. With enough depth, we can predict all possible states of the entire board until the very end of the game 
and make the best choice based on those predictions. For tic-tac-toe, this is all fine. We start with 9 choices, then there are 8 choices for each of those 9 options, then 7, then 6, and so on. While this still results in a lot of nodes, it's still something our computers can handle. When we compare this to chess, you have a lot more possible moves to choose from. Just look at all the pieces you have and how many moves each of those pieces can make. Remember that we need to consider all those moves and all future moves that can happen as a result of it. Just imagine how many different possible board configurations there can be, and that we need to consider all of them to predict the best possible move. And you can see why it took so long until the invention of computers to make a chess computer that can beat the champions. There are some optimizations we can do to the algorithm which reduce the amount of nodes we need to explore significantly. But even then, there is an enormous amount of nodes a computer needs to consider to make a perfect prediction. This is why a game like Go is so hard to solve the way we solve chess AI. There are just too many possible moves for a computer to solve. In order to write an AI that can beat the champions in Go, Google's AlphaGo uses machine learning to make predictions and determine the best move. But that is a subject for another video. If you want to learn more about AI and deep learning now, you can head over to Brilliant.org and follow their course on neural networks. They walk you through all the steps and the ideas behind it. They even have a course about machines learning chess where they walk you through the computer's way of thinking and show how it makes its decisions. Learning a little every day can have a huge impact and before you know it you have all the knowledge you need to make that dream game come true. Brilliant helps you learn specific skills and how to be a better thinker. It's the best way to learn math, science and computer science interactively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons with exclusive new content added monthly. To get started for free visit brilliant.org slash digitigger or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. The next big part of video game AI is being able to find a path from point A to point B. Let's do a small exercise. We take a grid with a couple of obstacles. Now try to find the shortest route from point A to point B. For simple cases, you can probably find the shortest route pretty quickly. But what if we add more obstacles and we place A and B further apart? Can you still find a path that is guaranteed to be the shortest between A and B? What steps would you take to find it and how would you guarantee that it is the shortest? Think about that for a bit. This is the kind of puzzle the first people who programmed pathfinding algorithms were faced with. One way to solve it is to use a breadth first search. You start from point A and start looking at all its adjacent tiles. For each adjacent tile, you add any adjacent tiles you haven't explored yet, and you remember the path you took to get to that tile. Then again, add all adjacent tiles you haven't explored yet, and remember the route. Continue doing this until you find a tile which contains point B. Because all tiles explore their adjacent tiles at the same time, you can guarantee that the sequence of tiles that finds B first is the shortest route. And there you go, because you remembered the route to get to each tile, you now have the shortest possible route of tiles it takes to get from point A to point B. Now, what if we add a few tiles that take more time to traverse than others? What if we add some forest and mountain tiles that take two and three times as long to traverse respectively? How would we find the shortest route then? For this, we can use Dijkstra's algorithm. Luckily, it is very similar to the breadth first search we just performed. The main difference is that now, each time we visit a tile, remember the total time it takes to reach it. Instead of just going through the neighbors of each tile one after the other, we now check the neighbors of the tile with the lowest time first. Another important difference is that now we can't just stop as soon as we find point B. For instance, look at this example. We take a step from tile A, then we explore a tile with the lowest cost and reach the next tile in time 2. Then we do it again, but this time we have to traverse a forest to get to the next tile, which takes us 2 hours instead of 1. Now our lowest cost is 3, so before we continue, we traverse the lower path. Our lowest cost is now 4, so we can continue exploring both paths and find that after we cross the mountains, we can reach B in 7 hours. But this time, we have to make sure that there is no other path that takes less time to reach point B. Even when we find point B, we must still continue exploring all the paths until there is no path left that takes less time than the time we currently take to reach the goal. After all, one of those paths might reach B sooner than the one we currently have. So we continue on. We still have a path that takes 5 hours instead of 7. 
So we explore this tile and we find that we can actually reach B in 6 hours if we avoid the forest and the mountains. We have found a better route. Now there are no paths left to explore so we're done. We can reach B in 6 hours instead of 7. This all works very well, but one drawback of Dijkstra is that in order to find the shortest route we have to explore a lot of tiles. This can become quite slow, especially if we do it during gameplay. So we're going to take a look at one more pathfinding algorithm, which is probably the most commonly used pathfinding algorithm found in games. A star. The main problem A star is trying to solve over Dijkstra's algorithm is that we're trying to find the shortest route by exploring less tiles. The way it does this is that for each tile we're trying to explore, it's making a rough estimation how far it is from our goal. An estimation can be the direct distance to our goal. For example, the further it is from our goal, the less likely it is that we'll explore it. Let's look at an example to make it more clear. Suppose A is in an open field and we're trying to find the shortest path to B. Instead of just taking the cost of each tile into account, we now look at the cost plus our estimation the direct distance to B. If we look at all the adjacent tiles of A, some tiles cost more to explore because they're further away from B. Because of this, we explore the tiles closest to B first. Continuing with this logic, we can see that the algorithm favors tiles moving closer to B. Just like with Dijkstra, once we reach B, we continue exploring paths until their cost is greater than the route we currently have. But this time, their distance to B is taken into account as well, so the routes leading away from B stop pretty quickly. When we compare this to Dijkstra, we can immediately tell the difference. The shortest path was found by exploring much less tiles. One thing that is important to note, the estimation we give to tiles cannot be bigger than the actual time it takes to reach the goal. Otherwise, A star would just skip tiles that might find a shorter route to our destination. These are some of the most common building blocks used in game AI. Like I said in the introduction, AI doesn't have to be incredibly complicated to produce great results. Like so many things in game development, it is often more important to use the building blocks in a clever way to make the AI come alive. Next episode, we're going to take a look at using some of the AI building blocks together to create more complex behavior. We're going to look at the decision making process of AI, like decision trees, finite state machines and more complex decision making algorithms. These allow us to combine basic building blocks into an artificial intelligence that can do multiple things like following you around, deciding when to attack, when to hide or when to dodge your attacks. I hope to see you all next time. Until then, you can already say that you're a bit white.